all weekend, even, even into this morning. I brought my, uh, brought my iPad, and I had to bring my, my charger, and it's still not charging. So if I lose the iPad, I'm going to be totally shooting from the hip. Yeah, it's at 5%. It's probably not going to last, so it's not charging. See? Got to resist them. Amen? <laughs> Let's just pray before we get started. I've, um, this is a long introduction to the end of the service. It's a long inter- introduction to the altar call because I, I really feel in, in, um, in light of uh, what is already happening during worship service, there's going to be a specific call at the end of service. So it's just a long introduction for that. But um, I, I feel that it's really important that the congregation just get a hold of what I want to share this morning. And then I'm just asking that there would be a response. And I really believe the Holy Spirit's going to move you to, to, to make a response. So Lord, we just give you this morning... We just pray, Father, that your will would be done. And we know, Lord, that we have to actively be involved in resisting the accuser because he comes against us, and sometimes he comes against us like a storm. And we need you, Holy Spirit, we need you to empower us to to resist, to stand in that storm so the boat doesn't sink, so our relationships don't fall apart, so our lives don't fall apart. Lord, we need you. We desperately need you. That's what we are crying out for all morning, this morning, when we are worshiping you. We were saying that we need you. And Lord, your response back to us is, I need you also. I need you to stand like living stones, living, breathing stones. I need you to stand and do what you've called to do. I need you to resist the enemy. I'll give you the power. I'll give you the strength. But I need your will involved to stand so you can withstand the fiery darts that the enemy is throwing towards you so that you can, can proclaim my glory and my strength and my love and your grace in your lives. We just thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm just going to yank out my phone and just do it from my phone. The last, uh, the last three weeks, I was going to say you've heard three stories, but really it's been four stories because the first story was from Bob and Deb. this sharing their testimony. And uh, Bob sharing his testimony about how Jesus just empowered him to overcome um, addiction and uh, many other things, but more importantly, restore their marriage. And I know Deb, because we were personally involved in this story, all of us were, because we were, we were praying, because we're family, we know about these things, and we were praying that the Lord would, would restore the marriage, and uh, Deb wavered a little bit. She had to learn to, to walk through this process of, of forgiveness. And really, the other two stories were, were kind of about the, about the same thing, just learning, learning how to forgive, forgive yourselves, forgive those who have done injustice against you. Um, uh, Max, Max's story was next. Max is our drummer that plays behind the, the little aquarium back there, but always has a smiling, smiling face. Um, you heard his story about navigating through his teenage years by not having a real father influence in, in his life, but then meeting Father God, Father God coming into his life and, and healing those wounds and those in, insecurities. And, and then uh, Lorenzo was the last story last, last week about how uh, a very similar story is, is Max has just grew up without a, that, that father presence in his life and uh, just negotiating some really difficult circumstances, some incredible injustice, and finding, finding forgiveness for his father, for, for family members, for those who committed those injustices against, against him. And, you know, I, I think that we can all connect in certain aspects to, to those stories. I mean, we've, we've all experienced offense. We've all experienced pain. We've, we've experienced broken relationships before. So we can, we can connect to that. And we certainly know the power of Jesus Christ, how Christ can come into our lives and put all those pieces back together again. And um, as I was thinking about those stories, I thought, you know, they could have gone the other way. And many do. You read about those stories in the news sometimes because, you know, they, they experience that pain. They don't know how to deal with it. They don't have, know how to navigate through it. And they, they respond in a way that, that puts them in jail or, or they end up in more, more horrible circumstances. I mean, we, we know, we know those stories, and, and I, think, I think some of us have experienced those tragedies because we, have, we haven't responded in a way that's loving and, that, and that's forgiving. That, that thing has just begun to eat us up and eat, our, eat up our heart and, and cause us to become bitter 
and uh, in, until we release that to someone that can actually take that away, that can bring, can bring healing, it just begins to, begins to fester. Um, so the whole, the whole series was about our, our testimony. And when we think about our testimony, the testimony just doesn't involve our story because we would have no testimony if it wasn't for Jesus, if it wasn't for Jesus. And, and that's the thing that has to be glorified and magnified in those, in those testimonies because he's the one that makes all the difference. So the testimony is not just about you overcoming, it's about the overcomer that's in you. So as we share those stories and we share those testimonies, it's Jesus that has to get the glory for them. And I know that Bob and Deb and Max and Lorenzo, they, they communicate, communicated that very clearly, that God gets the glory. God gets the glory. But they had to resist something. They had to resist this inclination in them to hide, to not bring truth forward, to, uh, to not just hide themselves in shame, not to give up. You know, I think there's some resistance in the Christian community to talk about willpower. But let's face it, when you read Scripture, it is very clear, while God gives us strength, He does not bend your will. You have to submit your will to Him. So there is some will involved. There's a decision that you have to make. I'm going to be a follower of Christ. I'm not going to give in to temptation. I'm going to resist the enemy. And all through Scripture, you see people resisting the enemy, sometimes giving in. You know, the story of one of the disciples. He was warned that he would deny Jesus. He was warned before he did it. And Jesus told them, the enemy, the accuser, desires to sift you like wheat. And really, that's kind of what this message is about this morning. Because he desires to sift all of you like wheat. In other words, he wants to bring things in your life. He knows your weaknesses. He knows your insecurities. He knows where you struggle. He knows the words that hurt. And he'll find people to say those words to you. He knows what tempts you. And he'll put things in your way that will cause you to be tempted. And you have to resist. Now, you have to find that spiritual power within you, the Holy Spirit's in you, to resist But you have to decide in your mind that you're going to resist. And some of you, and I've been there, I was struggling this weekend with some things. I was struggling putting together this message. And I I had to decide that I'm going to resist. I didn't want to preach this morning. All weekend, I'm like, I'm going to find someone else to preach. I don't want to preach this weekend. I mean, I didn't want to study. I just, I honestly did not, I just didn't have the energy I couldn't find the words. I didn't have a desire to study the words. I'm just gonna, I'm going to admit it. You know, and I think many pastors struggle with this sometimes. And I was really struggling this weekend. And then I, then I get up this morning and realize my iPad's not charged. And I can't start, charge the stupid iPad. And, and it's like, I, I, gotta, I, I have an opportunity here. I can get frustrated. I could get discouraged. I could just give in. I can say, um, you know, we're just going to sing songs all morning. We're just going to worship all morning. That's what we're going to, I'm just, the Holy Spirit, matter of fact, that's what he's telling me. That's what he's telling me. I'm going to have the worship team come back up and we're just going to sing. You know, seriously, I mean, we we have those things cross our minds. And I was battling with this all this weekend. And then I get here this morning and and it was clear what the word was. Resist. We're going to experience resistance. How many of you experience resistance in your walk? Uh, Look around. Look around. Those of you who think that you're... You're, you're in a boat all by yourself. You're on an island all by yourself. Everybody had their hands raised because we experience resistance. But you have to determine to stand. To stand. You have to determine that you're going to face that thing and you're not going to focus on the problem, but you're going to focus on the problem solver. Amen? Amen. So I got this passage, and I'm like, what does this really have to do with anything? <laughs> it's in Joshua 4, 1 through 7. I'm going I'm to read it to you, and I, and I realize the significance of it this morning. So this, uh, if, if you have your Bibles, turn to uh, Joshua 4, 1 through 7. If you don't have the paper Bible, pull up your smartphone. Hopefully your app works. If not, just look at the screen or listen to me. It says, 
This is, um, this is right after Moses had, Moses had passed away and Joshua was giving the responsibility of leading the Israelites into the promised land. It's such a powerful passage of scripture. I'm going to start with verse 1 and then at 7. It says, When the whole nation had finished crossing the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, Choose twelve men from among the people, one from each tribe, and tell them to take up twelve stones from the middle of the Jordan, from, the right, from right where the priests are standing, and carry them over with you and put them down at the place where you stay tonight. So Joshua called together the twelve men he had appointed from the Israelites, one from each tribe, and said to them, Go over before the ark of the Lord, your God, into the middle of the Jordan. If you haven't caught it by now, the Lord stopped the water, okay? So the priests are in in the middle of the river, and God stopped up the water, and they walked towards the ark of the covenant, said, according to the number of the tribes of the Israelites, to serve as a sign among you. In the future, when your children ask you, what do these stones mean, tell them, that the flow of the Jordan was cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. When it crossed the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan were cut off. These stones are to be a memorial to the people of Israel forever. So in other words, they carried their own testimony. And it was a, it was a stone. They carried them on their shoulders, and they put them there as an altar, as a memorial, to say, our God is able to help us overcome. And, you know, if you read through Joshua, it's about the Israelites finally going into the promised land and, you know, taking out all their enemies. And it's, it's an awesome story. Finish reading it for yourself. But the point was, God, God wants us to be memorials. That's what testimonies are. First Peter says that we are living stones. You know, he's, he's making us a royal priesthood. So when people look at us and they look at our testimony and they hear our testimony, they should hear and see and experience Jesus. So it's not just about telling a story about what the Lord has done. It's about living out that story. Let Jesus being be seen through you. And if you don't learn how to resist the enemy, like the Israelites finally learned how to resist the enemy after wandering in the desert for 40 years, basically that whole generation had to die off, needed a new perspective so that they could see that the promised land was a possibility. It's like he needed a new generation that didn't have a slave mentality, a poverty mentality, that they could have a new perspective and, and see the promises of God and walk towards them. Resist what maybe the, the moaning and the complaining from their fathers and their mothers and their uncles. They had to resist that. They said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna stay here. I'm sick of being in the desert. I'm sick of manna. I would I don't know what manna tastes like. But for 40 years, it couldn't have tasted that good. I mean, could you imagine eating TV dinners, Salisbury steak dinner? Every day, every day for 40 years. I mean, it's just my, I mean, actually, Salisbury steak dinner, that sounds too good. What's pea soup? Pea soup. Could you imagine eating pea? I'm sure the manna, the manna was sustenance, but I'm sure it didn't taste like steak or something like that. But, but seriously, they had to resist all of that, they had to get a new perspective. They had to see the giants as small in their eyes, or they would never make it to the promised land. You know, God will empower you to get to your promised land. You know, he's spoken vision to you. He's given you destiny. You know it's in you. You all, you have dreams. You know, there's things that you want to achieve, but you will never achieve them just with the power of God alone. He needs you to come into agreement with that power. And unless you do, the enemy will have his way in your life. I'm talking to believers here. I'm not talking to non-believers. I'm talking to believers. If we aren't diligent, if we aren't circumspect, if we aren't in the word, if we are not in prayer, the enemy will have his way. He may not be able to steal your soul or your spirit. He may not keep you from heaven, but he'll keep you unproductive. And that's, he's He's satisfied with that. If the accuser 
can somehow hide the Jesus that backs the testimony, somehow your testimony becomes just another story. That's where this message began. Your testimony can't just become another story. I read stories, I read success stories all the time. And they're really cool while I'm reading them. I mean, I even have an emotional response like, that's so awesome. Wish that happened to me. That's really cool. But you forget about them. You forget about those stories unless they involve the Jesus that made the difference. The person that made the difference. I don't, I don't want people to remember me or my successes. I want people to remember the Jesus in me. That will have a lasting effect. That will have a lasting impression. That's what our testimony is about. Jesus in us. John 10.10, it's it's the passage of Scripture, actually the, the reference that's on the front of your bulletin. It reads like this, The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it in full. There's an adversary in our life that wants to silence us. He'll use your insecurities... He'll use your doubt. He'll use your shame. Really good at using shame. Shame is that like guilt that you always feel because of stuff that you've done that you can't seem to get rid of, that you can get rid of if you leave it at the cross. I mean, that's the whole point of the cross. Come to the cross and Jesus puts his cloak of righteousness around you and God sees you as beautiful because of the power of the cross. But some of you haven't had that revelation yet. It's maybe some of the reason why some of you are still struggling in your stuff. Because of that condemnation and shame. Does not come from the Lord, by the way. It comes from the devil. God doesn't condemn. He he brings conviction through the Holy Spirit. But the point of conviction is to bring you to the cross so so he can put resurrection life in you. His desire is that you have life, not that you be guilt-ridden the rest of your life. There is nothing, no, no sin, no crime committed in this room. While there may be consequences from man, as far as God is concerned, there is no sin, no crime that you've ever committed that God will not forgive you for. Some of you need to know that. Some of you need to know, some of you that have been caught in habitual sin, and you're dealing with stuff. God has another story for you. That doesn't have to be the rest of your story. But you have to resist. You have to resist the tempter, the accuser. I want to read you some of the names of the devil. Yes, he's alive. I know there are some churches that are teaching that there is no hell. And there is no doubt. I don't know what Bible they're reading. There are 23 passages in Scripture that talk about Satan. They call them different names, but there's 23 passages of Scripture. And and the Bible talks of hell. And by the way, God didn't make hell for people. God made hell for the devil and the fallen angels. Hell's not for you, but hell's a very real place. But if you decide to side with the devil, most likely that's where you're going to go. That's just what the Bible says. But God does not desire that. So if you come to him and you resist the adversary... Where's the names? Everything's so small on my phone. (laughs) I could blow it up, but then I'll see less words. Well, I can't find it. But anyhow, he's called the accuser. He's he's the tempter. He's, uh, come on, give me some names. Father of lies. lies. Yeah, murderer. He's, he's, he's. The beast. I mean, he's just all sorts of terrible things in in Scripture that all relate to how he can affect your life. He's a thief. And what he wants to do is steal your identity from you. From believers, he wants to steal from you those promises that God has spoken over you that you're having a hard time believing because you're dealing with unbelief. Somebody spoke about that this morning. So what do you do about unbelief? You say, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to believe the promises that you've so clearly spoken to me in my heart and that are in the word. <clears throat> There's this really interesting book that I uh, somehow found out about, and I, I, don't, I don't feel really comfortable giving you the title yet of the book. 
um, because I haven't read it all, and I don't want you to go grab the book and read it and say, Pastor Dave told me to read this book. This is a, that's a groovy ring. <laughs> but in this book, it was, uh, it, it, it's, it's basically a, um, a biography about the testimony of Satan. No, it sounds kind of weird. Um, I know who the author is, and he's not a flake, but Satan appeared to him, and God was with him, and God communicated to him to write down what the accuser was sharing with him, and the accuser was basically sharing his testimony. He's got a testimony too. It's not good. It's not a good one, but he's got a testimony too. And he was sharing how he tempts humans and it's very similar, reminded me of the book by C.S. Lewis called Screwtape Letters. It's kind of a modern day version of that. I want you to listen to what it said in the book. As he was, as he was communicating this to this individual, he said, and this is, this is Satan speaking, and he's speaking about Saul before he was Paul. He was relating this story. He said, I was, I was able to take over his mind, speaking of Saul before he was Paul. And have him believe my thoughts were his thoughts, as many of you do. But I was wrong. The only thing I was able to do was to be an unlikely messenger, still serving him by placing a thorn in Saul's side. The thorn sent pain initially, but the prick of pride. And pride is my favorite emotion, for it undermines all other drives of the mind and heart to overcome evil. Pride becomes evil because it manifests into self-righteousness. Saul's pride was my tool to control him and kill the followers of Christ. But my mistake was that by inflating his sense of self, I made him susceptible to Christ. He was not evil enough to be consumed by his own anger and hate. Thus his heart yearned for the glory that is God versus the power that I offered in him. So there's two sides to every trial that you experience. There's two sides. Often, and you know this to be true, often that pain, that heartbreak, that shame, that condemnation that could have ruined you, that could have made you part of Satan's testimony because you turned to Christ, because you were made aware of how loathsome you can be, how hateful you can be, the murderous thoughts that your mind can have, the lust that could be in your heart. Because you were made aware of that, you felt such conviction that you turned to a God that can take that away. So there's two sides to every trial. But that's what resisting is. It's about getting God's perspective about the thing that you're going through. If you, you want to keep somebody hooked on something, addicted to something, have them meditating on that thing all the time. That's why I feel a lot of this addiction counseling and all these programs fail. They keep you meditating on the thing that you're struggling with. And if you think about that, it's dumb. It's dumb. Because you're always thinking about it. You're always thinking about that struggle. They even tell you to, to declare this. And I know, I know they're shifting in that community. But they have you declaring that you're going to be that thing for the rest of your life. That is not the word of God. And some of that has infiltrated the church. That is the devil telling you that you are not going to be what God has promised you're going to be. That you're going to stay where you're at. But you have a decision to make. To reject that, to reject that perspective, to reject those thoughts and replace them with God's thoughts and God's promises. And he calls you an overcomer. He calls you the head, not the tail. He calls you the victor. And you are the victor, not the victim. You want to be the victim? You keep ignoring the Lord and ignoring his promises and give in. Give in to those thoughts. You'll be the victim. How many of you want to be a victim the rest of your life? Yeah, I'm the only one raising my hand. I don't want to be the victim. How many of you want to be the victor? How many of you want victory? Then resist. Resist him. And you know what the Bible promises? He will flee. He will flee. That's right. There's people reading their Bible. 
This is exciting. So Saul resisted the tempter and soon became Paul. Changed his name. I'm almost thinking when somebody gets saved, we should change their name. You might be able to get rid of the name that you don't like. But that's often what happened in Scripture. God changed their name. And I think, I think he was trying to communicate something in that. You're no longer that person anymore. People may know you as Saul. But once they start to see me and you, they're going to think you're a different person. And they're going to have to call you by a different name. So how do we resist the devil? I have a passage of scripture. This is another passage that the Lord gave me. It's in Ephesians. I'm going to read it out of the Amplified Bible, and I'm going to shortly come to a close. It's in Ephesians 4, 25 through 32. And uh, you don't have to turn there. I I don't know if I have it in, in the Amplified up there. I think that's New King James. So you can just listen to this. This is how you resist the devil. Therefore, (coughs) rejecting all falsehood, whether lying, defrauding, telling have-truths, spreading rumors of any as such of these, speak truth, each one with his neighbor, for we all are parts of one another, and we are all parts of the body of Christ. Be angry, he understands we're going to be angry at sin, at immorality, and at injustice, and ungodly behavior, yet do not sin. Do not let your anger cause you shame, nor allow it to last until the sun goes down. And do not give the devil an opportunity to lead you into sin by holding a grudge, or nurturing anger, or harboring resentment, or cultivating bitterness. The thief who has become a believer must no longer steal, but instead he must work hard, making an honest living, producing that which is good with his own hands so that he will have something to share with those in need. Do not let unwholesome, foul, profane, worthless, vulgar words ever come out of your mouth, but only such speech, this is for the younger generation, but only such speech as is good for building up others according to the need and the occasion so that it will be a blessing to those who hear you speak. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, but seek to please him by whom you are sealed and marked, branded as God's own for the day of redemption, which is the final deliverance from the consequences of sin. Thank God there is that day. Aren't you looking forward to that day? But until then, what do we do? Oh, a few of you, six of you. (laughs) Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor, perpetual animosity, resentment, strife, fault finding, in other words, pointing fingers, and slander be put away from you along with every kind of malice, all spitefulness, verbal abuse, malevolence, be kind and helpful to one another, tender-hearted, compassionate, understanding, forgiving one another readily and freely, just as God in Christ also forgave you. In other words, it's saying, master your emotions, or your emotions will master you. You should write that down. It's really good. I don't think I came up with it. It did come into my mind, but I probably heard it somewhere. If you do not master your emotions, if you don't master your flesh, it will master you. You have to resist the devil, the accuser, the tempter. He's, he's called a roaring lion because he's, he's stalking you. And you have to resist him. Yes, God will give you the power, but you have the will to do it. You have to make up your mind to do it. And some of you have not. You wonder why you're still struggling. Because you've chosen to give in. Scripture is very clear. God, by the way, is not the tempter. He allows temptation, but only for your perfection. Temptation is not bad. Giving in to temptation is. God is not the tempter. But it says he allows temptation to refine you. 
so that you realize you can't do it alone. But if you turn to God, you turn your will towards him, you say you're going to do it his way, he'll, he'll empower you to resist that temptation. So he allows us to be tempted, but he will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we can bear. And he will provide a way of escape. The problem is, many of us, I've been there, don't take the way of escape. And when you don't take the way of escape, you're not resenting, resisting the tempter. You find yourself in a deeper hole. Sometimes find yourself even addicted to something as a believer. And by the way, yes, I believe a believer can be addicted to something. I don't believe that you can just continue to pursue that and ignore God and, ignore, and, and you're in a good place. I don't. You're not in a good place. You're actually in a dangerous place. The, the Bible says for someone like that, they should cast him to Satan. By the way, that doesn't mean that, you know, here, Satan, take him, kill him. It's for the destruction of their flesh so that they can come to a place where they're at their wit's end, they're so desperate that only God can save them, and they call out to God, and trust me, God is there. It doesn't matter whether it's a fourth or fifth or sixth time. If you honestly want his help, he's there to help you. He never shuns you. He never pushes you away. He's not some like earthly fathers are that have written you off because you've blown it so many times. He's not like that. You can't burn a bridge with God. Not if you really want his help and you really love him. But if you resist him, then that temptation is not going to become a sin in your life. But you have to resist him. In conclusion, <coughs> there's a passage in 1 John 4.4. 4. It says, You are of God, little children, and you have overcome them, because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. But you have to follow or allow him to be greater in you. It's not just a given. He's there to give it, but you have to take it and receive it and apply it and keep resisting. So I have a very specific altar call this morning. I think they're already coming up. The worship team can come up. And I'm going to have the ministry team just give you some time when you get up here. But I have a very specific calling. And I feel like it's very similar to where Peter was at when the Lord told him that the enemy desires to sift you like wheat. You've been feeling like you're being sifted. And you're giving in to temptation, and you're tired of it. You're tired of it. You want to get into the promised land. And you want your life to be a memorial, like it was those Israelites when they were crossing the Jordan, and they were placing the, those stones as a memorial. You want your life to be a memorial. That when people look at you, they're not remembering your screw-ups. They're not remembering the thing that has defined you for so many years they're seeing Jesus in you. They're seeing the victor, not the victim. And that might speak to why some of you are still struggling because you're making excuses for yourself. It's time to put the excuses away. Stop making excuses for yourself. Well, I'm dealing with this, and you know, I, I have this hurt, and I have this pain, and I sympathize with that. I do. Some of you experience some incredible trauma and incredible pain. But I'm telling you, in Jesus, he can take it all away. All away. But you have to give it to him and, and not use that as a crutch for where you are. Because I feel like that, that's some of you out there. You're, you're using this as a crutch. You're saying, I'm the way I am because of all this stuff happened to me. Well, if you're here, then you believe or you want to be a Christian, a follower of Christ, which means you have to subscribe to his way of doing things. And he says, you are a new creation. All things, by the way, he says, become new. Not just some of it, not just some of you, but all things. It doesn't mean that he erases the past. It doesn't mean that the memories go away. But I do believe he removes the emotional response to the memory. So now the memory becomes something that you give praise to God instead of that memory becoming something that defines you and causes you to fall back into that temptation again. 
So I'm going to ask you, I believe that anointing that was being talked about this morning, there's a special anointing for freedom this morning. God wants to set you free. You hear my heart this morning? God wants to set you free. I want to see you free this morning. I don't want to see you struggling with the same thing over and over and over again. But you have to get up and make those steps, those memorial steps and say, I'm not going to be this anymore. I'm not going to give in to this anymore. And you will be the victor and not the victim. Do not let shame keep you in your chair. I'm not even going to ask you. And I'm going to tell the ministry team not to ask you what you need prayer for. But I want you to come up here and believe that you can be free this morning. So come. Come to the altar if you want freedom. Come to the altar. There's freedom here. There's freedom in Christ. There's freedom in Christ, whether it's, whether it's depression you're dealing with, whether it's a chemical or, a, or, or a, an emotional addiction, whether it's codependency on relationships. There's freedom here. There's freedom here. There's freedom in Christ. Come on, say it. There's freedom in Christ. There's freedom in Christ. And whom he sets free is free indeed. That means completely free. If you want freedom, come to the altar. Come to the altar. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Do that work. Do that work in us. There's no shame. There's no shame by coming to the altar. There's no shame. There's no shame in you. There's freedom. There's freedom. Just ask the Lord to forgive you. Lord, take this pain. Take this sin. It's what you died on the cross for. You died on the cross for me so that I can be free from this. So I don't have to continue to hang my head in shame, to feel like I'm double-minded, to feel like I'm two people, but that I can be one. I can be one with you. I can be free from this thing. And today, Today marks a new day for you. This whole thought that it's, it's not going to go away. I'm still going to struggle with this. Understand, today, today, you're putting a line in the sand. All right? You're putting a line in the sand, and you're saying, Satan, you're over here, and I'm over here, and you can't get to me anymore. I'm not giving in to that temptation anymore. That today is a day of freedom. Come on. Yell it out. I'm free. I'm free. I'm free. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's freedom. Come on. Sing it out. Sing it out, Ryan.